we are. All right. We'll just give it a little bit of time before uh, we get started. I want to let a few more people get on. Okay, so let's get started. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to PNP Live. My name is Faith, and I'm the Shipping and Receiving Manager here at Politics and Prose. Uh, thank you for joining us on this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. Uh, I'm excited to welcome our guest author, Kirk Wallace Johnson, in conversation with George Packer. Before we get started, we have some housekeeping notes. Please note that the closed captioning is available for tonight's, tonight's program. Click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select enable transcript. You can click the link and we'll drop it in the chat so you can get your own copy of The Fisherman and the Dragon. Uh, lastly, if you have a question for our author, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. Uh, let's see, purchase your copy, oh, I see. Uh, at the, end of your, at the end of the presentation, your guests will have time to answer some of your questions, and you can also upvote the questions you like and want answered. Now onto the event you're waiting for. Kirk Wallace Johnson is the author of The Feather Thief and To Be a Friend is Fatal, and the founder of the List Project, project to resettle Iraqi allies, which he started after serving USAID in Fallujah. His writing has appeared in the New Yorker and New York Times and on This American Life, among others. George Packer is an award-winning author and staff writer at The Atlantic. His previous books include The Unwinding, An Inner History of the New America, The Assassin's Gate, American Iraq, and Our Man, Richard Holbrook, and The End of an American Century. Uh, he is also the author of two novels and a play and the editor of a two volume edition of the essays of George Orwell. It is my pleasure to turn this event over to them. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> and hi, Kirk. Hey, I'm happy to be here with you. <laughs> Me too. I'm just going to tell the audience that you and I have known each other for about, what, 15, 16 years. Uh, it was Iraq that crossed our paths, and we've remained close friends ever since. So let's talk about The Fisherman and the Dragon in the context of your first two books, because I want to see the line that connects them. I know there is one. It's not obvious. The first book, To Be a Friend is Fatal, is an account of your efforts as the founder of the List Project and as a former USAID uh, official in Fallujah, Iraq, to essentially rescue Iraqis who had worked for the United States and who were getting no help from the US government in trying to escape uh, various armed groups that were out to kill them. Um, the Feather Thief is about a caper, uh, uh, a, a guy who broke into a museum in England and stole an incredible bounty of um, 19th century and or I think early 20th century feathers that had been collected by famous naturalists and that were worth a lot of money. Um, the Fisherman and the Dragon is about this country and it's about um, an incredible war that took place on the Texas Gulf Coast in the late 70s and early 80s and that most Americans live today don't know anything about it, if they've even heard of it. So first of all, can you connect the three dots? Is there, <laughs> is there a pattern here? Um, does the know, story find you and, and um, you're off to the races? It's, it's fine because, um, you know, like uh, the, I discovered the story of the feather thief years into what felt like 
it would be a never ending battle with the US government on behalf of, of Iraqi refugees. And there was something so different and shiny and strange about that story that had nothing to do with war, that had you know everything to do with obsession and status and greed and all of these things um, that, I mean, I have vivid memories of you know, testifying before Congress about what was going to happen when we left Iraq and Afghanistan and the need to start doing contingency planning to evacuate our allies. And then I would check into my hotel room and log into these sort of illicit underground feather forums and like take, take screen, screenshots. And so I was investigating that at the same time, but that was a sort of, I guess, a way to give my brain something else to focus on uh, other than this very kind of heavy work. But when that book came out, all of my friends and contacts in DC sent me you know, press about it saying like some, some weirdo with your name has also written a book about feathers, you know, a feather thief. So there, there's not an obvious through line other than the second book was sort of an escape from the circumstances of the first. Plus, and with the plus, you are a fly fisherman, yeah. and those feathers um, were highly coveted by fly tires, and that, I think, is how you came upon the story. Yeah, and in, and in, I mean, I really, I mean, I'm a Midwesterner, so we were we were raised to to think of fly fishermen as sort of insufferable elitists, and so I never I never fly fish growing up, but it was only after I got back from the war and was dealing with some PTSD complications that I started fly fishing and that, and it was while I was on a river that I discovered that story. So there, there is a sort of, um, there is an obvious uh, thread running through all of that. Okay, but, how, did, how did you find this story, the story of the fisherman and the dragon? I, you know, I, I like being a Swede, I, I really always assume that whatever I accomplish is the last great thing that I'll ever do and that it's all downhill from here. And so the feather thief was, has had such an extraordinary life, but I, I was just thinking like, well, I'll never, I'll never find another, you know, good story for a book again. That's probably it. Um, I don't have a process for like selecting stories. They just have to grab me, but this one grabbed hold that in a very unexpected moment in my life, because, um, it was, I mean, it was December 3rd of 2018. My dad passed away from cancer that was uh, spurred in large part by his exposure to Agent Orange um, during his deployment to Vietnam. And I was in Los Angeles and it, it just kind of felt wrong to sit around the house like it was a normal day. And so I, I wanted, I had this kind of overwhelming urge to just go be on a river and fish because my dad taught me how to fish. And so I threw my gear in the trunk and I drove up into the southern Sierra Nevadas. And uh, while I was in the car, I had the radio on, but I wasn't really listening to it. And then until a song by Bruce Springsteen came on called Galveston Bay. And Springsteen was singing about this young Vietnamese guy that got resettled to Texas and he's trying to rebuild his life as a shrimper but he quickly runs into these white fishermen that don't want him there. And then all of a sudden the clan is involved. And as I was kind of sloshing through the rivers and mourning my dad, I, I, the song kept popping into my head. I thought it was such a strange premise for a song. I didn't, I didn't know anything about this event. I knew a fair amount about the fall of Saigon, but not, not anything about once, what happened once they got here. And maybe a week or two later, I, I just, started googling to see if it was based on anything and quickly found this sort of treasure trove of a lot of great local reported accounts from back then um and then i figured somebody must have written a great book on it and when i discovered that nobody had written a book i then thought everyone must be dead but i, I kept digging and and soon found myself you know sitting down with just about everybody that that lived through the events of this book. You said you don't have a process for um, finding a new story. It has to grab you, but there must be 
some set of, of qualities a story has to have to grab you. So what was it about this one that made you want to spend three or four years of your life on it? Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's like one of my best friends when, when we were in college, when we were all kind of learning about ourselves, said something that always stuck with me, which is like, no one comes to talk to you, Kirk, about the weather. <laughs> and I, I wasn't, I don't want to do some, something small. I want to like tackle something. I want to be constantly pushing myself and, and also pushing myself into stories about which I know nothing. Cause I, I do feel that that can be an asset as a nonfiction writer to, to come into a story clean. So you can ask dumb questions that maybe your pride might get in the way of. But if I, you know, I guess there's a part of me that I want stories that are, that have some kind of thrilling core to them that has a, a pretty propulsive clip to it, but that illuminates some kind of larger story about ourselves or about the country or, or, you know, you know, humanity, not to be overwrought about it. But I mean, the feather thief was a, you know, that's a crazy story about a kid that stole some dead birds, but it's really a story about greed and status and, and the kind of moral myopia that, that comes from, from when those two things are, are braided together. And this one I saw as a, you know, I, you know, it was coming, I discovered the story at a time where I had just spent nearly a decade of my life fighting on behalf of refugees and was now confronted with a country that was at a historic low in terms of how it regarded immigrants and how it regarded refugees. And I mean, I had a, a small part in, in fighting Trump's refugee ban with things that I never thought we would have to do. And so in some regards, I felt that this was a story that allowed me to pull together a lot of my, my kind of deep passions that like what these questions about who gets to be an American, what do we owe those that are fleeing these disastrous wars of our own doing? Um, who gets a piece of the American pie? And, and this is also a, a story about the environment and what, what do we, what are we willing to trade in exchange for short-term jobs if it means the long-term destruction of our, of our environment or of our own bodies, you know? So all of that improbably was wound up in the events of that Springsteen song of, of a clash, a turf war between newly arrived Vietnamese and a, and a white group of fishermen that traditionally held sway over this. And they, you know, they, they didn't like these newcomers. They blamed the newcomers for their misfortunes. They then ran to the Texas governor to, to, seek a ban on refugees. And when that failed, they brought the Klan in and the Klan started firebombing Vietnamese boats and, and homes and, and everything kind of spiraled from there. Yeah, I want our listeners to know that this story, as you tell it, is riveting and has a, a little of everything that's a thrilling story needs. It has a killing, it has a trial, it has a second trial. It has um, the Ku Klux Klan. It has um, flawed but heroic efforts by civil rights lawyers, by a woman who becomes an environmentalist to try to stop the massive injustice going on on the Gulf Coast. Um, and it really has so many of the ingredients of what people are obsessed with today and you mentioned immigrants and refugees and the environment and corporate power and the fear of native white Americans that they are being replaced. That word comes up in a few of the quotes from the yeah. Texas Texan shrimpers from the 1970s and 80s. It feels quite um, prescient as if something that we're living out now, you can see seeds of it then. But why don't you, Kirk, why don't you tell us a little about the story? Sure. What, 
what is the basic plot of your book? And um, as you tell it, tell us how you found it, how you figured it out, how, how you did the reporting and the research. Sure. Well, so I'm, as I'm sure many in the audience know, but in, after a sort of disastrous two decades in, in Vietnam, uh, formally and informally. 1975, fall of Saigon, huge exodus of, of, of refugees. And as you well know, and you've written about, um, the American public did not want to let these Vietnamese in. There was only, I think the Gallup poll as Saigon was falling said only something like 34% of Americans believed that they should have any future in America. But President Ford ignored all of that. And he said, tough, we're going to help these people to do less would add moral shame to humiliation. And Ford, within, is, Ford is not remembered for his um, moral courage on this, but you, no. you have mentioned it in a couple of your books and it's, it's worth um, noting in history that Ford stood up to a lot of pressure in order to bring 135,000 Vietnamese refugees into this country. Yes, and he brought them out. I mean, what was astonishing was that he gives this address and within, within a few weeks, Congress passes a, 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 the Indo-Chinese Refugee Migration Act and gives hundreds of millions of dollars to evacuate these, these Vietnamese. And yeah, within, within I think uh, six or 10 weeks or so, we had uh, the first wave of 130,000 made it to America. And now, unfortunately, one of the US senators who initially opposed this refugee resettlement was uh, President Joe Biden. Right, and, and probably for a, a lengthier, angrier conversation later, but you know, I, don't, I don't think Joe Biden has been a, a friend of refugees and we've known that for a long time. Um, but the, in that first wave, the lion's share went to Southern California and then the second largest community ended up around Galveston Bay and on the Texas coastline. A lot of them went there because they had been fishermen back home, but also because the climate was familiar to them. And, you know, I, I, it, it still shocks me that I, I need to say this to people nowadays, but like nobody wants to become a refugee. They didn't, I, all, with all love to, to Texas and, and the other parts of the country that, that these Vietnamese ended up in, like they weren't clamoring to, to end up in this, these tiny towns of a few hundred people in rural Texas, they would have given anything to be at home still. But they end up here and they start trying to rebuild their lives as fishermen, those in Texas. And at first the whites uh, were, were elated by their presence because we're, we were in a, uh, an insane period of inflation. There was, at the, at, because of the Iranian revolution, there were huge uh, shortages in fuel and gas queues. Um, nobody had any great optimism about the future of the country, but also there had been a kind of catastrophic couple years of, of hurricanes and other climate incidents that had created like a, a disastrous couple seasons out on the water with a low catch. And so the whites faced with this, these depressed economic circumstances were delighted to unload these dilapidated boats on the refugees, sometimes at five or 10 times the true value, um, playing them for suckers at first. But the Vietnamese did everything right. They fixed these boats up themselves. They loaned each other money because for the most part, they were denied access to any loans from, from white bankers. Instead of giving a, a a third or a quarter of the, their daily earnings to some outside deckhand. They used family members uh, as deckhands. They were living tend to a trailer. They would eat the fish that white people consider junk fish from the bays. All of this to save up money to so that they could start getting a toehold here. And within a few years, they were so effective at this that the whites frankly started freaking out. And, and blaming the, the, the Vietnamese for the decreased catches and saying that they were breaking the unwritten rules of the Bay. Um, 
and basically pointing a withered finger at them saying that the reason why everything's going poorly in our life is because of this, this frankly small number of Vietnamese that were on this coastline. And so into that kind of pressure cooker arrives this 18 year old Vietnamese kid named Sao Van Nguyen. He ends up in this little town of Sea Drift, maybe eight or 900 people in it at the time. And he's just, he's a crabber, crabbing like in the hierarchy of fishing in the Gulf, it's like Gulf shrimping, bay shrimping, then crabbing and then oystering. And so when you're broke, you start out at the bottom with oystering and crabbing. And so Sal was just, you know, every morning going out, running his traps, just trying to, to make a little bit of money um, uh, to catch crabs. And he just ran afoul of, of a white crabber named Billy Joe Applin, who thought that this young Vietnamese kid was dropping his traps in the wrong place. There was a kind of heated confrontation out on the water between this white crabber and a number of Vietnamese. There were knives brandished on both sides. And with over the subsequent several weeks, every time Billy Joe would see this sow in town, he would just give him death threats. He would say he's going to kill his family. He stabbed his tires. He raised a rifle at him. And at some point along the way, Sal goes out and buys himself a pistol from Walmart. One night, Sal's out at the docks. He's just gotten a new engine for his boat, I think. And Billy Joe comes up and starts pummeling him and pulls a knife out and slashes him across the chest. Sal races back to his trailer park, to his trailer, gets his, gets his gun, and he races back to the docks because one of his brothers is down there and he's worried that Billy Joe might harm him. Billy Joe sees him, starts fighting again. Sal draws his pistol and shoots him dead. And this quite literally set the, the coast on fire. Um, Sal had to flee town that night because he was worried that the Ku Klux Klan had infiltrated the local police. And so he figured he would turn him in in a, in a, in a town farther up the coast. But then a, a posse of, of white sea drifters angry about the killing of, of Billy Joe at two or three in the morning um, set out with a, you know, uh, Molotov cocktails and set fire to a Vietnamese home. Uh, and then, which was at the moment occupied with some 10 or 15 refugees and then went down to the docks and started uh, torching Vietnamese boats to the water line. Um, like I'm, I'm going into a lot of detail only because this, this killing to, led to some very unexpected outcomes, which was that Sal eventually he turns himself in. Everyone thinks he's going to, you know, get the death penalty, but he is eventually acquitted by an all-white jury in a very conservative town of Seguin, Texas. Um, and that acquittal basically pours fuel on the on, on the the fires that were burning between these two camps. And before you know it, the, these rumors start kind of ricocheting through town that the Ku Klux Klan is coming. And no one, no one in this small town understood why the Klan was coming. And it, it became so like, I mean, Walter Cronkite was covering this. Is the Klan going to come to this town? What, why are they coming? He was the, the grand dragon of the Klan was alleging that it was a mistrial because there was some lost evidence and he was looking into irregularities or, or some such. This town of almost a thousand people got together and, and unanimously passed a resolution telling the Klan to buzz off basically and to leave us alone, don't come here. But the Klan comes anyways and they, they have a little march, it gets national news, it gets you know print and TV. Um, and then they leave town. Um, what happens is that that grand dragon of the Klan, a guy by the name of Louis Beam who was a highly decorated Vietnam War vet. I, I, my contention is that I think he basically saw an opportunity here that he realized like, oh, I, if this, is a, this is a sensitive issue. The press eats this stuff up. And every time I even talk about involving myself in it, I get national press, which increases my membership and my membership all pays dues. And he's, he's making his living off of dues paying Klansmen. It wasn't until 40 years later 
during the course of, of investigating this book that I was able to finally understand why the Klan was initially so invested in this case. And it's because Billy Joe Applin had himself joined the Klan. And I had a very kind of uncomfortable interview with his widow whose life was, you know, destroyed by this, this incident. Um, but it wasn't until the rise of, of Donald Trump and the kind of resurgence of white supremacy and that rhetoric in the last several years that she finally decided to acknowledge that they had joined the Klan a year or so prior to this killing. And that's why the Klan involved themselves. I don't know if I'm talking <laughs> too much or this is like- No, a no, no. You, we need to know the story. And that is the, that's not the whole book by any means, but no. that is the drama that, 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 ignites the rest of the story and it's written with cinematic vividness and and page turning uh energy and i'm wondering kirk as a writer how did you go about digging into this in order to get what a writer needs to make the story as cinematic as this story is you basically have a series of short chapters in which we, we are in a scene and we are hearing dialogue and we are seeing people go get their gun and seeing them torch a house and seeing them drive off on in their car. And how did you collect the detail you needed in order to make the story as fresh and powerful as it is? Um, well, first off, I'm like very, uh, it's like a little, out of body experience to hear such kind things from you about it. So thank you for that. Um, um, I think I, I had a kind of pit bullish determination to just grab everything I could. And so that meant, you know, driving to little podunk courthouses throughout Texas to see if any of their doc, if any of these transcripts and court proceedings were still there. It meant badgering the FBI through FOIA at petitions to get documents released. Um, I flew down to um, Montgomery if, a couple times because the Southern Poverty Law Center was involved in representing Vietnamese in, in the second large case at the heart of the book. And there they had, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty substantial case box of, with thousands of pages that I was just you know, photographing and scanning every single page. Um, I was thinking about something that Robert Cairo wrote that you just, you can't be biased about what's, what page is important, that you have to read every word on every page and you never know what might, what might come up. Um, but I also, just from a storytelling perspective, I, I really, I think we probably share a, a love of John McPhee, but McPhee always has this ability to find a particular detail that can stick deeper in someone's brain and, and Velcro the rest of the story in with that detail. I'm just thinking of one example now, but he, he wrote, I don't remember the name of the, the piece, but he wrote something about like, uh, like a farmer's market in probably in the seventies or something, but, and he wrote about um, like a fruit vendor and he was just, the fruit vendor was complaining about how savage people are with their fingernails and apples and they drive their fingernails into that. And every single, it's like been decades since I read it. And every time I buy apples now, I think about McPhee and I turn the apple around to look for fingernails. And so those are kinds of like, uh, like that's what I'm looking for in these interviews. I mean, most of my interviews with, with the people at the heart of this story, I mean, I don't, the main characters in the story, I, I probably spent between, you know, 10 and 40 hours of recorded interviews with each of them because I just, there were so many times where I thought I might have what I need and then I'd, I'd go back to the well and sometimes it wasn't until the fourth or fifth conversation that something extraordinary would 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 come loose. Um, you know, one of the guys who set fire to that, that uh, Vietnamese home in Sea Drift, it wasn't until the fourth phone call that he, mentioned that he was also the the fire truck driver for the town he worked for the city and so he set this fire yelling at these vietnamese to get the hell out of sea drift um 
turning them into refugees once again. And then he's skulking home, hoping not to get caught when he hears the, the, the town siren. And he walks over to the fire truck and then goes, helps to put out his own fire. You know, so there are those little things that I, that I look for. But I mean, ultimately, this was, this was the hardest, hardest thing I've ever written because it was such a, a, a complex story, but also the stakes here are so important that the themes that, that run through the heart of this and the fact that I'm dealing with living people that I, I really, I wanted to make sure that I was doing justice to their stories and not just taking a shortcut or something because it was more interesting. The, the sort of simple version would be Ku Klux Klan against Vietnamese refugees. We know which side we're on. We know where justice lies. And that is kind of the heart of the story. Uh, or the heart of the plot, but you have a number of characters who don't fit into that um, binary. And you even have mentioned a couple of things just now in our conversation, like a trial of an all-white jury in a conservative town that acquitted a Vietnamese man who shot a white man point blank. Um, yep. And a town that unanimously voted to tell the Klan to stay out. Um, and there are others too. So talk about what you learned about the place, the people who live there and their complex attitudes toward um, the world coming in, both refugees, but also uh, corporations, foreign corporations, um, and the Klan itself, which didn't have much of a foothold until um, Lewis Beam and Eugene Fisher uh, brought it to Sea Drift in order to make trouble. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, you know, it's. I mean, I was, I was pretty fascinated just by the the geography of this story because I, the first time I went down to Sea Drift, I couldn't, I couldn't, I. It just, it's a little speck of a town in the middle of nowhere of, of cotton. All there are cotton fields and petrochemical plants at this point. Um, there's, no, there's no shrimpers? There are, the shrimping industry is, is nearly dead at this point, the bay shrimping industry, um, largely because there, you know, it, for folks that might not remember this from, from high school, but I mean, like te Texas, and right off of Galveston Bay, that's where oil was discovered in America. So there are a full, at, at, I think at the point of the, the events of this story, something like half of all of the chemicals and plastics in America were being produced on this coastline. A full third of the petrochemical industry was there. And to service that industry, all of these senators and politicians you know, courted, courted big industry from all over the world, from Ty Formosa and Taiwan, you know, Dow Chemical, uh, Union Carbide, Exxon, all of them, with big tax credits to say, come build your plant here, we'll, we'll dig deep bays for you, and we'll impound these rivers, and we'll, we'll take all that fresh water and give it to you, and we'll give you discharge permits so that you can run all that fresh water through your plants, make your plastic bags and milk jugs and all of these things and, and other heavier duty chemicals. And then you can dump all that water into the bays. That's fine by us. And so that all, that process started from the, from the forties onwards. And so, you know, I opened the book with Billy Joe Applin pulling up a, a mutated crab and seeing this kind of misshapen shell as this thing kind of clumsily skittered across the, his boat and realizing that something was wrong. And he, he started sensing that these, these plants were the reason why things were going poorly in this industry. And he tried, he tried to rally his fishermen, his fellow fishermen to fight these plants, to form like a legal defense fund, but none of them would get involved because they were, most of these fishermen work in these plants in the off season. So- And did they, so Kirk, did they turn on the Vietnamese because Billy Joe Applin could not organize um, opposition to what was really hurting them, which was uh, chemical waste and oil spills 
And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's it a fascinating question because I, I think, I don't think it's like, if this, then that. I think it's more, I mean, I remember there's one quote that stands out from the mayor of Sea Drift, I, if I'm remembering right, where he said, you know, these, these shrimpers, these crabbers, they've got so many problems, but the Vietnamese are the only ones they can actually get their hands on. They can't take on some, some crabber who's making 4,000 bucks a year isn't going to take on Exxon. Mm -hmm. And so there, there was a kind of, I think, venting or outlet, not to justify it, but I think that's part of the, one of the kind of misfortune that, that these Vietnamese stumbled into. They didn't realize just how bad things had gotten. Um, but no, I mean, there, there was a, you know, I, I didn't know anything about this when I started out, but I mean, it, you know, as Billy Joe was harassing Sal and, and, and as he was killed and in the, in the run up to the trial, there was the single largest peacetime oil spill in world history, just farther down the, the Gulf there and across the border in Mexico that, that leaked something like 140 million barrels of oil for almost a year before they could cap it. It was the largest oil spill until the BP disaster in the Gulf in 2010. That a slick the size of Manhattan drifted into Texas water and was sort of lapping at those, those shorelines, tarring them with, with oil. Um, there were constant tanker collisions in Galveston Bay where all this toxic stuff was either burning and turning the skies dark or, or floating to the, to the bottom of the, or sinking to the bottom of the bay. So I, I do think there is like a, um, I, the way that I saw this story was that you had a way of life that, that worked, I guess, for, for generations of fishermen that, you know, they go out, they cast their nets for, for several hours and they come back and you can, you can raise a family off of that and, and have a, a, a kind of modest uh, comfort in life. But then as those plants kept metastasizing, as, as, as humans kept pouring concrete over the estuaries for highways, for, for hotels, for vacation homes, as climate change accelerated, like there, there was, there's increased severity of droughts, decreasing the freshwater going to the bay. There's, there's increased hurricanes that are scattering the catch. And then something else crazy, which was that in Galveston Bay, the US government basically perfected shrimp farming. And so my old employer, USAID, once we had figured out how to properly farm shrimp, my old boss sent experts from Galveston Bay all over Southeast Asia to Vietnam, to Malaysia, to Thailand, to teach them these techniques. And the hope was that we can kind of boost their economic activity and, and all of this. And that all started in the 60s. And it came back like a heat seeking missile 20 years later. So the same year that all of this stuff boiled over with mm -hmm. the Vietnamese, that was the first year that the majority of shrimp bought in America was imported farmed shrimp. So there were the, it's like this is a story about globalization and, and free trade deals in a way as well, you know. And so these are you have these these fishermen that are, you know, they're trying their best, but they can't figure out how to stop these so things. It, so it's sort of a, a saltwater version of the deindustrialization of the Midwest, the mm -hmm. steel cities, the auto cities, um, with some of the same forces at the same time, globalization, yeah. trade deals um unbridled capitalism and so when you go there today a little bit like going to youngstown or to toledo you don't see the life that you describe in the book you don't see the small shrimp trawlers uh anchored along the docks you don't see the houses uh the small houses of the shrimpers that are right yeah. along the waterfront you don't see any of that when when I when I drove through Sea Drift, I was I, I this will sound melodramatic, but I gasped in the car because I I went up and down Main Street and there there was just quite literally not a single store in business. It was all boarded up. Um, I went down. I made several trips down to Galveston Bay just to go shrimping with one of the the men at the center of this story. And every single time that we went, uh, that I that I flew down there, there was a some 
toxic chemical disaster, a tank that explode, uh, you know, a plant that exploded on the on the shoreline, or some other ship collision that basically killed what was in the bays. Like there were there were there were crabs crawling up onto the shore to die. Um, the the shrimpers there are um, they're not their kids aren't following them into this business. They're in their 60s, 70s, some of them in their 80s. Most of the people in this area, including the shrimpers, have cancer. This is called the cancer belt in America. And it got so crazy that I could tell who worked at what which plant based on the kind of cancer that they had. Um, and so, you know, Jody Collins, one of the guys at the at the center of this book, I mean, he he told me about certain channels that he can still go and catch shrimp in, but he had to, he always has to wear a bandana because the stench from the toxic fumes is so overwhelming. And he didn't make sure not to get any of the muck on him because he just, he'll never get out of his clothes or anything. And, and that's, he wouldn't touch that shrimp, but that, that shrimp going into the American marketplace. Um, so no, this is not a, um, this way of life is, is over. Um, it's just that in the midst of all of those kind of you know, catastrophic and massive forces of destruction, some demagogues sailed in like Lewis Beam and said, it's, don't, don't look at all this stuff that's happening on the shoreline. These people who don't look like you, these refugees, these immigrants, they're your problem. They're the reason why things haven't gone the way you, you wanted them to. He called them communists when in fact they had, uh, most of them had been in the South Vietnamese army fi fighting communists and were in the United States because they lost their war to communists. Hey. In fact, the Vietnam War hovers over the entire story because it seems as if almost every one of the white shrimpers is also a Vietnam veteran. So you have this collision between two groups who had been together, although not necessarily affectionately together in Vietnam, and were now directly colliding and, and in conflict in, in Texas. That's right. And you know, you mentioned the communist allegations. <clears throat> 40 years later, the one question that would reliably, I could expect a, a, a Vietnamese person that lived through all of this to come to just boil over with outrage was that allegation. So Colonel Nam, who's at the heart of this, he, he ultimately, he was this charismatic colonel in the South Vietnamese army, fought for 22 years, had special forces training with us at Fort Benning, um, incredibly distinguished fighting career. And he, you know, washes ashore essentially in Texas and starts his hand as a, owning a fish house and a, and a shrimp boat. And, I, I met with him a few times and I mean, he's 81 or 82 right now. And, you know, his memory is failing. His verbal capacity is, is starting to fade a little bit. But when I brought up the communist thing, he, I mean, it was like I was talking to a 30 year old again. He was just livid at the accusation that he could be a communist. Before we go to questions, uh, one or two more things, Kirk. Um, we should tell the audience that the last third of the book is about the environmental catastrophe uh, along that stretch of the Texas coastline and about one woman in particular who is a shrimper, a rare female shrimper, um, who takes it upon herself to be the Jeremiah or the Cassandra um, or the Henry David Thoreau um, to carry on a, a very lonely fight against plastics corporations against toxic chemical corporations against um, the oil companies, Alcoa. So tell us a little about Diane Wilson and the role she plays in the book. Yeah, she might she might even be on this feed right now, but she this I don't think this book this book would have been a pale shadow of itself were it not for Diane. I mean she she not only was the sole female shrimper on this coastline, but she's from Sea Drift and she lived through all of the events of the book. She she knows she was, you know, classmates with some of those that that torched some of these boats in the Vietnamese home. She was the only one who kept telling her her 
fellow townsmen like look the ignore the vietnamese they're not your problem look at the plants they're they're the real problem and she kept pulling up these mutated shrimp and and crabs and other things and building this kind of collection because she had a hunch that it was the plants but that then led to a three decade long battle against these plants that cost her nearly everything i mean she uh i mean her marriage broke apart her kids were you know furious for all the time she was spending on this she did um, you know several month long hunger strikes to the brink of you know organ failure she nearly killed herself in despair she has had a lifetime of death threats um she's you know at one point a helicopter hovered and shot her dog i mean she's she has this incredible she's been arrested so many times but she kept plotting ahead to try to fight to protect these bays from big industry and two years ago she made history by winning the largest settlement in U.S. history under the Clean Water Act against one of these offenders, uh, Formosa. Uh, and she now, frankly, represents the last best hope for any of these shrimpers, whether they're white or Vietnamese, that she's, she's now trying to use that settlement to clean the bays up, but also to to form co-ops so that the, the shrimpers stop fighting each other and they pool their catch to, to art, you know, barter for a better rate. Um, she's, an, a, she's an incredible woman. She's 74 now, I think. Everyone in town thinks that she's a multimillionaire, but I, I know for a fact that she lives on $425 a month from Social Security. She finally has health insurance for the first time in her life through Medicare. Um, and she she was just arrested a couple months ago for for protesting uh, a plan to to dredge the main bay in in sea drift, which is the bottom of which is just fouled with with mercury that's been pooling there for for decades. So and and quickly, Kirk, before we go to questions, what is the lay of the land between white and Vietnamese shrimpers? Um, ha has time and the unbelievable crimes of the of the plants the corporations finally begun to ease the enmity and to bring some kind of sense of of unity or is it you know, think, like just as bad as it was 40 years ago i don't i don't think it was as bad i don't think it's as bad as it was 40 years ago there's a there's a passage of time that i think has you know when a shrimper when a shrimper disappears from the boat gets gets knocked off in a storm or something it doesn't matter if you're white or or vietnamese they all all shrimpers go out into the bays and they drop their nets to try to scoop up the body and there's there's enough of those incidents it sounds morbid but it's these types of things have i guess maybe reinforced a, a, a shared humanity i don't want to paint a rosy picture though that they all they're all pals that the truth yeah. is that um you know, Jody Collins, for example, one of the shrimpers at the heart of the book, you know, he was dying of cancer, taking hits off of his respirator and, and we're down at the waterfront and, and his boat was half sunk into the bay, no prayer of going out. And he, but he pointed across this channel to about five or six other Vietnamese boats and he took a hit off his respirator and he said, you see those? I was here before these Vietnamese got here. There's only five left, and then I'll have the bays back to myself again. And he he died six months later, and his boat was bought by a Vietnamese shrimper. That's the the saddest epitaph. Let's um, let's go to some of the questions. This story clearly has so many important messages, but who do you think needs to hear them the most? Oh, um, you know I. I, I, I don't have a, a right left sort of axis for this. There's, there were so many things as you, as you mentioned that defied stereotype. I mean, one of, the, one of the main arsonists that torched these boats, he's, he's like a diehard Obama voter, you know? Like he, you know, so that, that this isn't just something where people should read this and feel sanctimonious about, uh, their position with respect to 
the right wing of the Republican Party or the South or anything like that. Like you said, there were plenty of people in town that fought to keep the Klan out. Um, this, this is a complicated story, but I think, I mean, part of the reason why I gave it the title that it has was I, I, I want it to evoke some, something of a parable that this is, this is, uh, this particular story is very much a Texan story, but if you read it, you will see that the forces at work here uh, are, are playing out in just about any industry uh, in America and in any part of the country. Um, and so I, I wanted people to like, I guess, re-engage with some of these big questions about what we owe those fleeing our wars, but also what the role immigrants have in this country um, without it being so, uh, you know, corrupted by the current debate over Trump. I mean, I can't have a meaningful discussion about refugee policy when when Trump comes into the conversation. So th this is sort of a, a way to re-engage with these issues by talking about something that happened 40 years ago. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But... So far, I haven't heard of any um, similar conflicts between Afghan refugees and um, native-born Americans, and I hope I don't. Yeah. But there, there are parallels which are uh, alluded to by the next question, honestly, my jaw just dropped about the Gerald Ford, Joe Biden fact. As an Asian American woman, I'm so floored that I'd never known that. And then she asks, how would you suggest regular people go about finding these histories that are hidden, less known or untaught? So it's an interesting question. It shouldn't just be the business of professional writers. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that you know, I don't know if I'm going to give a satisfying answer to this because I, I was so blown away by what the Vietnamese did here because we, you know, we only got into some of it, but like they, they ultimately stood their ground and they sued the Klan in a historic case. And I think did a service to future generations of refugees because they, they basically did a knockout punch against the Texas Klan, got this militia disbanded. And this is, of course, a counterfactual, like I, I can never prove it, but I, I do think that if they had not stood their ground, that the Klan would have been emboldened to go and try this in, in other parts of the country. But when I sat across from, you know, Vietnamese that were sheltering in churches, running from, from whites who were giving them death threats, who had been shot at, who had, there, there were Klan boat patrols menacing uh, Vietnamese shrimpers. This is one of the things that I know you've seen in your conversations with Iraqis and Afghans, but like in the hierarchy of a, of a Vietnamese refugee's sort of traumas, this, this rated so low to them <laughs> below what they had just experienced back in losing their country. So I, you know, like I kept I kept kind of doing this golly gee, like how how could you like this is amazing. And to them, they were just this was just another kind of um crappy thing that happened to them. But the only reason I mention that is I think that that kind of resignation or maybe unfortunately that sort of emotional callous that they've been forced to develop, I think it no one from that community has written this book. You know what I mean? And so I, th I think it just takes, I don't know, I guess the, these stories are out there and, and, but I, you know, like I said, I don't know how to find them. I just happy when I do. Well, there is a key scene where Morris Dees, the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center, who's the lawyer who goes down to Texas in order to convince the Vietnamese to sue the Klan mm -hmm. in order to stop the terror stop the violence and intimidation he tells them you know you've just got to rely on the constitution and the laws and you're thinking why should they well, yeah. they're not even citizens they have been given so little rights and standing and yet they do and so that for me was a crucial moment when they decide to take the claims of you know, American justice at face value. When they, and, when they certainly could have armed themselves and fought back, Lord knows they, 
Yeah. They had enough experience to do they, so. They knew how to do that. So here's a, here's a good question. What is your secret to get people to tell you secrets that they've kept hidden for so long? Oh, uh, my, my wife asks this all the time whenever I play her audio from from some of some of these interviews um it's a terrible mistake to do that kirk because <laughs> our the tricks are not pretty things to listen to in the <laughs> light of morning <laughs> no that's true but i i think there is a i guess i come from a point of view that if somebody's going to give me some of their time for an in-person interview i'm i'm going to come in loaded for bear but so it i mean all of my all of my um, interview notebooks. Um, I, I usually spend thirty to forty hours just prepping and thinking through the sequence of questions, and those questions are all written in a notebook that they can't see. But ideally, if it's somebody who I suspect or I've heard of has done something bad, I'm I'm. It's a constant kind of game of like. Playing, playing the idiot at some points. And a lot of times I act confused and I'm like, well, I, I, thought, I thought you said to this journalist in 1982 that this is why you did, how do I reconcile this? And, and a lot of times it's just boxing somebody into a corner until they, they know like, look, I've, I've got it. So they might as well tell me their, their version of it. But then there were some times, I mean, I, you know, I walked into one guy's trailer, David Collins. He had just finished what I think was like a kind of petty meth deal. Um, and before I even sat down, he was just, you know, he just beamed. He's like, sit down, I'll tell you everything. And he, for, for the course of a couple hours or so, just he rattled off like where he burnt the clan crosses, what his thinking, you know, which insurance scams he did when he set fire to these boats. And, you know, I think towards the end of the interview, he could tell that I was a little just searching for some footing and he leans back and he goes just make sure you spell my name right in the book so that like ego and vanity is always probably the the biggest reason why people say dumb things to a writer he'd just been waiting for someone to come along so he could tell you yeah um let's see i think we have time for maybe one or two more have any vietnamese attempted to run for office locally i guess that means locally on the texas gulf coast in other words is has this community that were refugees 40 years ago achieved political power? Um, or has the shrimping industry deteriorated to the point where they've, they've scattered? They, there's no longer a large Vietnamese community there. They, they have, they have, they're not in the same numbers as they were in the smaller towns. A lot of them followed the similar arc of saving up everything they could to send their kids to these great universities. And now their kids are, are supporting them. There are, um, I think she's Louisiana or possibly even Georgia, but B. Nguyen is, uh, I think she's running for a statewide office now, but she's, she's, in, she's been in state legislature. There was a US Congressman, and forgive me, I'm blanking on his name right now, but they, they have not, um, I think they're still kind of finding their their path and it's into political power right now but they haven't been as sort of aggressive in seeking office as as i think they should be kirk thank you for writing the fisherman and the dragon oh, i wish sure. it you all the best uh it's a gripping book that um deserves a, a wide readership and knowing you you're going to get one <laughs> thank you so much george this means a lot to do this with you and I also want to thank you, Kirk, for being here with us today and for sharing your book with, with our audience. And I want to thank you, George, for moderating our event. Uh, I want to also thank the audience for your wonderful questions. We really appreciate your engagement. Uh, you can click on the link and get a book for yourself, for a friend, for a family. Uh, I'm, always, I'm, I'm always encouraged. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we want to thank you for supporting independent bookstores, and we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you for being here.